Hi everyone, um, my name is Christine Rogers and I'm going to be facilitating this workshop today. Um, we're really excited to bring you this session about angling access and opportunities. As you can see, um, all of you are not visible on our screen, but you do have the ability to enter your questions into the chat box, which is on the right hand side of your screen. So you can type in any questions that you have for our speakers and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the session. So I'm going to start off and introduce you to our presenters today. Uh, Marsha is the chair of Trout Unlimited's New Jersey State Council and serves as TU National Leadership Council's diversity and inclusion workshop. And then Kelly's going to be joining us. Uh, she is Trout Unlimited's National Leadership Council representative for New Jersey, and she's also the co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Work Group. And then finally, Keith is Trout Unlimited's um, Habitat Restoration Coordinator for Northwestern New Jersey, and he's responsible for planning and implementing projects that benefit the wild trout populations in the state. And it, he's also working with the Great Waters Partnership to map and protect recreational waters throughout the state. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. Again, you can ask any of your questions that you have in our chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you're having trouble seeing um, the PowerPoint, you can just click on the bottom square in the bottom uh, right corner of the screen and that'll enlarge it and make the PowerPoint full screen for you. With that, Keith, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Christine. I'm actually just going to get my PowerPoint full screen for me as well. Um, so I just did that. So thanks, everyone, for, uh, for joining us this afternoon uh, so we can talk about some angling access and opportunities in northwestern uh, New Jersey. Um, and thanks for the introductions, Christine. Um, sorry. So for those uh, who don't know about Trout Unlimited, we're a nonprofit uh, conservation organization that was founded in, in 1959 in Michigan. Uh, and since then, we have grown to uh, nationwide. We have about 300,000 members across the country, um, organized into about 400 local chapters and state councils. Um, so collectively, and we have about 250 staff members as well, like myself. Uh, and so collectively, our mission is to bring together diverse interests uh, to care for and recover our rivers um, so that our children can experience the joys of wild trout um, and wild and native trout and salmon. And so to kind of accomplish this mission or work towards accomplishing this mission, uh, we take sort of a four-part conservation strategy. Uh, we try to protect intact watersheds and intact uh, habitat for our wild trout. We try to reconnect rivers um, and fish populations uh, by engaging in things like dam removal and, and road infrastructure upgrades. Uh, and we seek to restore degraded habitat um, and reconnect streams to the floodplains, replant riparian zones, um, et cetera. Um, so those are the sorts of on the ground projects that we do in the name of wild trout conservation. Uh, but really uh, this fourth pillar of sustaining our work is extremely important. And this doesn't just mean trying to find the funding opportunities uh, to engage in our work, but it really means finding the people in the communities um, where we can connect on wild trout conservation issues. And that's largely what this talk is about today. Uh, so we're gonna have sort of three different parts of this talk. Um, the first, um, kind of assuming that some of you out there might not be anglers and might not and, you know, know the intrinsic uh, enjoyment and value of fishing. So we're gonna talk about, you know, from a river professional standpoint, you know, why it might be important to think about and care about fishing. Uh, secondly, we'll actually talk about places to actually get into the water and fish in northwestern New Jersey. Uh, on the map on the right, you can kind of see where our focus area is. Uh, we're looking from uh, the Muskinacong watershed in beige uh, in the south, you know, as it comes out of Lake Patcong, all the way up to the Flatbrook in light blue um, and some of the headwater Del Delaware streams um, in the tri-state area. Um, and then finally, in the last section, we're going to talk about how TU and how many other groups across the country are thinking about uh, growing our angler steward community. So those anglers who are both love to fish, but also, you know, think a lot about uh, conservation needs in our communities and in our watersheds. 
you know, so why I think about fishing. And so the most important you know, reason why I think about fishing in my own work is to think about how fishing and kind of watershed protection and water quality feedback on one another. Uh, so trout fishing through different mechanisms, you know, I think can actually lead to water quality benefits. Uh, and so we'll talk about some of these mechanisms in a second. Uh, but then benefits to water quality also feedback um, into improving trout fishing. Uh, so by doing things like reducing bacterial loads, reducing temperature, increasing dissolved oxygen, and improving habitat, you know, we're increasing uh, trout fishing opportunities and the enjoyment of that experience, uh, which then can feed back onto water quality gains. So this is kind of the conceptual model by which, you know, I kind of engage in my conservation work and how to kind of more broadly thinks about um, engaging both anglers and conservationists. So as I said, I want to try to talk about a few of those ways that we think about trout fishing actually benefiting water quality. And the first and maybe the most important is through uh, stewardship. So there's a decent amount of research out there that shows that angling and boating participants you know, actually exhibit key indicators that lead to uh, increased on the ground stewardship behavior. And so those key indicators are things like um, anglers having a, an increased sense of responsibility, sort of a sense of ownership over uh, local waters, um, and also an increased sense of the cause and effect relationships uh, between human action and environmental impact. Uh, and so angling can lead to you know, these indicators that increase our stewardship behaviors on the ground. Uh, but what's really important and what this paper here kind of espouses quite a bit is that those teaching someone to fish needs to be coupled with conservation education to really uh, get the most benefits in terms of uh, from stewardship uh, from angling experiences. Uh, so once we get people hooked on fishing, you know, what do they actually do on the ground that potentially benefits water quality? Uh, you know, many of our angler volunteers are engaging in things like stream monitoring or trying to identify problems, you know, before they get really bad in our streams. Uh, they engage in stream cleanups. Um, they advocate for streams in many different ways. Um, and, you know, they get boots on the ground and they raise funds to actually restore streams. Um, so uh, we do tree plantings, dam removals, um, all that sorts of work, you know, our on the ground chapters um, are doing uh, every day. So another way that trout fishing and trout populations can potentially you know, benefit water quality is through increased stream protections. So New Jersey uh, Department of Environmental Protection is tasked with setting water quality standards for all of our rivers and streams, um, and then ensuring that, or monitoring, ensuring that our streams are actually attaining uh, those water quality standards. And when they're not putting in the work uh, to actually, you know, move them closer towards at attaining those water quality goals. Uh, and so how trout can, can kind of benefit uh, water quality through these stream protections is that they actually require um, more stringent uh, water quality standards than uh, places where trout don't exist. So because trout are really sensitive species, they have uh, very high, uh, very low tolerances to lots of different forms of pollution. Um, you know, those streams must be protected at a, at a more stringent level than streams that don't have trout. Um, so on the right, you can see the most recent integrated report uh, put out by uh, the state of New Jersey. And it shows that many of our trout uh, waters are actually um, not attaining the standards they need to um, in northwest, northwestern New Jersey. And in theory, that should provide, you know, eventual funding mechanisms to actually improve water quality uh, in those locations. Um, so that might be more of a way that trout themselves, the actual animals, uh, can lead to increased stream protections. Uh, but there are also ways that the activity of trout fishing can also lead to improved stream protections, um, you know, maybe sometime in the future. So right now, uh, the DEP actually does have the authority to upgrade stream classifications uh, based on the exceptional recreational significance of our waterways. So if a stream is exceptionally recreationally significant, um, we could potentially you know, upgrade it from a C2 classification to a C1, which would afford it more water quality protections. Uh, however, in practice, the state has not actually defined yet what exceptionally recreationally significant waters are. Uh, so they don't actually use um, this criteria for, for 
uh, classifying streams. Um, so if that definition, you know, sometime in the future actually includes things like angling uh, as, you know, recreationally significant, that's another way that trout fishing could benefit water quality. Uh, and finally, you know, one last way that trout fishing can, you know, directly impact water quality is by bringing in uh, additional conservation funding to our watersheds. Um, so in 2019, um, there were about 93,000 fishing license sales in New Jersey that were associated with trout angling. So these are ones that include the purchase of a trout stamp. Um, and this generated $3 million uh, in revenue, um, much of which goes back into the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, who is tasked with, you know, both managing our stocked trout fisheries, but also implementing research and management programs to improve our wild fisheries as well. Um, and it, kind of in addition to that, uh, the federal government had actually returned $3.7 million to New Jersey in 2020 through the Dingle Johnson Sport Fish Restoration Act. Um, and so this is a, a federal tax on uh, fishing equipment as well as boating equipment that gets fed back into uh, states kind of divisions of fish and wildlife for those tasked with uh, managing our sport fish. Um, and these, so these go back directly into research and habitat management projects that are supposed to benefit our sport fisheries. Uh, and finally, there's many organizations out there um, who are both angling and conservation minded. So organizations like TU that put in thousands of volunteer hours a year and raise thousands of dollars a year, um, you know, Kind of specifically to improve um, wild trout populations, uh, but through all three of these funding mechanisms, mechanisms we have seen and we know that wild trout projects often have many corollary benefits for drinking water quality, for uh, reducing flooding, uh, and for you know water quality benefits in general. Um, so those are some of the kind of water quality benefits uh, associated with fishing, uh, and so now I just want to talk about some of the economic benefits that we can attribute to fishing and fisheries conservation as well. Uh, so it's kind of harder to get local information um, and local data on these sorts of uh, topics, but we can start out at the national level. And we find that fisheries habitat work uh, is actually really efficient at generating uh, economic benefits to regions uh, while investing relatively uh, small amounts in comparison. So this study um, in 2010 um, evaluated the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, annual fisheries program and where they expend about $130 million a year uh, in supporting that fisheries program, which has habitat restoration and conservation as a, a large part of its focus. Um, and this analysis determined that you know, from that $130 million of expenditures, um, there's about $3.6 billion dollars in regional uh, economic benefits generated and about 68,000 jobs supported um, by those investments. Um, so the investment really did pay off, um, at least at the national level. Um, a little bit more locally, we also, you know, we have some numbers on how fishing can generate um, some potential tourism dollars for our regional communities. Uh, so this study um, that was kind of uh, took place across the Delaware Basin show that about $600 million is spent annually on trip and gear expenditures specifically related to recreational fishing trips in the greater Delaware Basin. Uh, so, you know, this study doesn't really differentiate between fishing in the bay versus fishing in, you know, our headwater, uh, you know, tailwaters up in uh, New York uh, versus fishing in New Jersey. But in general, you know, there's a significant amount of money being generated you know, particularly related to recreational fishing trips um, in the Delaware. And finally, we can also just look at within New Jersey itself, uh, how fishing has changed in the past 20 years, and specifically how out-of-state trout anglers have actually increased threefold uh, in terms of uh, license sales in New Jersey in, in those past two decades. Um, so we can't really interpret this uh, too far, but in, sh in short, what it probably means is that we have more visitors coming to New Jersey to engage in trout fishing. Um, and because most of our trout waters are in Northern New Jersey and you know, especially Northwestern New Jersey, we might expect that some of these visitors are coming to our Northwestern New Jersey region as well. So I hope that was just a kind of a, an overview and a, 
a way to get you thinking about how fishing might might mean more to than just uh, fishing when it comes to conservation. Um, there, there are many different benefits in addition to just the, the joy of fishing itself. Um, so next I would like to talk about, you know, where can you actually get out to fish or, you know, if you're an organization that wants to get people out to fish, what resources are available uh, to, to help you point people in the right direction. Uh, so again, this map on the right shows sort of the region that we're talking about today that covers our Great Waters region or the Upper Delaware Watershed Management Area. And that ranges from the Muscanet Kong uh, River watershed in beige at the bottom, you know, up to the Flatbrook um, and smaller tributaries in the north uh, and, you know, Montague. Um, so putting these numbers together, you know, even though I'm a kind of, this is my job, I should know these numbers. It's really just astounding to see how many fishing opportunities really exist in Northwestern New Jersey. Um, so the, the map on the right also shows stream access points and lake access points. It shows uh, managed stocked and wild trout fisheries in, in blue, and it shows trout bearing streams or wild trout streams on public lands in black. Uh, and so you can see that there's 340 miles of state managed stream fisheries in, in this part of the state. Uh, and there's about 120 different access points to actually get on these waters. Uh, we have about 40 different public access ponds and lakes that the state recommends uh, for fishing. Um, and this does not count the, you know, the dozens or hundreds probably of private ponds on, on farms, on golf courses, you know, in your local communities that are also great places to fish in as well and great places to introduce people to fishing. Um, it's definitely the type of place that I, you know, learned how to fish. Uh, and finally, for, for those who like to get out into the backwoods and fish really small streams and connect with wild trout populations, um, there are 130 additional miles of small streams, wild trout streams on our public lands uh, that we can try to get out and access and hunt down some, some small wild fish. So just a ton of different opportunities out there. Um, but before we really get into, you know, how do we find those opportunities, I'd like to just throw up a disclaimer that, you know, depending on your age and on your residency, uh, you're most likely uh, going to need a fishing license uh, before you can actually get out and fish. And so those um, can be purchased online. If you search for New Jersey freshwater fishing license information, uh, you can get to this, uh, the, the state's website here in the top right, or you can purchase a license or find out more information about how to purchase a license. And if you need one, um, you can also purchase fishing licenses in your local sporting goods stores, uh, or if your big box stores um, like Walmart have a sporting goods department in your area, uh, you can get them there as well. Um, so once you purchase a fishing license, if you need it, um, it's also important to follow the regulations um, that are kind of uh, provided. Uh, the information kind of of those regulations is provided sometimes with the license. Um, so it should be provided in this freshwater fishing digest you see in the bottom right corner. Um, there is both a print version of this that should be available at any sporting goods store uh, where you're purchasing license. And there's also an online version on the Fish and uh, Wildlife uh, website for anyone to access. You don't need to actually have a fishing license in hand. Anyone can read through these regulations. And so these regulations tell you kind of where you can fish, when you can fish, and how you should be fishing. Uh, and it's important to follow those regulations because they really ensure that you know we're managing our resources for the enjoyment, our fishing enjoyment now, um, but also for future generations uh, get to enjoy that same fishing experience. So once you have a license and you know you want to go fishing or you like to take someone fishing, you know how do you actually find a place to fish? And so I think uh, the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife is again a great starting point to find the information. Um, so I think we'll talk about lakes first. Um, and actually the fishing digest, so that same document that provides the rules of, of where and when you can fish, also provides great information, information on what lakes, public lakes are around um, where you can go fishing. So this is just a snapshot on the top right of what that table actually looks like in the fishing digest. It provides information on the name of the lake, what town the lake is in, um, how big the lake is, if you can boat on it, um, if there are good picnic facilities, that's you know, really important if you're thinking about taking families or to, to get, get out and fish. It also provides information on what species you should you know, 
expect to find in that pond. Uh, so this is a really great resource, especially with, like flipping through paper. Um, and the state actually recently uh, kind of digitized all this table and for table based information into an online interactive map, uh, which for certain audiences might, you know, be a lot easier to use um, and a lot more friendly to actually search. Um, so this map is available at this address. Um, if you also just Google great fishing close to home in New Jersey, you will uh, find a link to it as well. And so in this map, you can search for your home address to see what ponds are nearby. Uh, and you can click on each of these icons, these fish icons you see, and get the same information that you would get from that table in the Fishing Digest. Um, this could be opened on a computer, a desktop computer, or on a smartphone. So you could use it even when you're out traveling if you just want to stop by and find a lake uh, wherever you're traveling to. So it's a pretty great resource that the state has recently um, developed. So to find streams, uh, Division of Fish and Wildlife is a good place uh, to look look to first as well. Um, so within the Fishing Digest, the, the state provides uh, the stream names for all the streams that it stocks um, each year, uh, as well as all the streams that it officially manages as wild uh, trout streams. So this could be wild brook trout streams, rainbows, or brown trout. Um, and so they also provide the regulations, which are generally a little bit more stringent on those wild trout streams uh, than on the general stocked waters. Uh, so um, the information of these streams has their stream name and also the town in which the stream runs through. Uh, but otherwise, it kind of takes a little bit of work to try to connect the name of the stream and the township to the actual places to go fishing. Um, so on the Fish and Wildlife uh, Department's website, they do have written descriptions of some access points for streams. So this is just a snapshot you can see on the right, but you can go to this link to, to find those written descriptions. Uh, and these will tell you, um, give you directions to actual uh, stream access points, uh, depending on which stream you want to go to. Um, so this is kind of very similar to the, to the lake resources that the state offers, except they don't currently have an interactive map available for, um, for their stream access points. Uh, so kind of given, partially given that lack of uh, interactive map uh, and online information for stream access points, which I, I, I personally feel is, is a little bit easier for me to navigate and find fishing spots and might be for certain audiences as well. Uh, TU and its partners have recently been developing online uh, recreational uh, mapping programs so you can access them at this link above our Great Waters website link, um, where we actually digitize a lot of the information the state has available uh, with respect to uh, what streams um, are managed by the state as stocked or wild trout fisheries. Um, you can, as you just saw, you can click on those uh, different streams to bring up information on the regulations. Um, you can actually get links directly to uh, the regulations online. Um, you can find each of the different stream access points and actually click on those access points to automatically pull up Google Maps. And here what you can see is we've also provided open space information um, in each of our, our seven watersheds in the Great Waters region. Uh, where you can click on those open spaces, you know, maybe that streams run through uh, to find trail maps for those open spaces or the open space websites. Um, just hopefully collate some of this information so it's a little bit easier for those uh, who are trying to get out and go fishing, finding open spaces to go fishing, um, but don't just want to look through the table um, and want to explore all the different opportunities. Um, so I'd greatly encourage you to go to this website, uh, explore it, and provide any user feedback. You know, does it work? Does it not work? You know, this should be compatible on cell phones as well. If you want to take it out into the field and try to find some access points, you know, on your next trip to northwestern New Jersey. Uh, and so finally, the, the previous kind of two sources of information on where to fish, you know, both the TU's maps as well as the Division of Fish and Wildlife's information, I kind of provide a quick introduction um, and uh, directions to, to fishing locations, but don't really provide the meat of what some people would like to know about uh, when they're trying to find fishing spots. Uh, so I'd also suggest that there are some guidebooks out there. Um, these are just three of the more popular ones that I know of. Um, 
you know, I haven't read through through all of them. I'm not going to make any particular recommendations, but there are guidebooks like this. There are online forums that you can go search um, that, you know, talk about New Jersey fishing opportunities in more detail. Um, so things like what gear works best in a certain stream, when is best to fish a certain stream or pond, um, you know, and what flies or lures or baits, you know, might work best to, to catch those fish. So I'd suggest checking those out as well. Um, so for the last kind of portion of this, uh, this part of the talk, I just want to briefly go through each of our major watersheds in northwestern New Jersey, just to shout out um, what makes some of these unique in terms of the potential fishing experience they offer. So I'm not going to provide, you know, particular locations that you should go to to go try fishing. Um, hopefully we've provided some of the resources to go find those, those access points um, online. Um, but yeah, I just want to give a quick overview. Uh, and we'll start in the north uh, with the Flatbrook watershed. So uh, this watershed, in addition to the Musconetcom, hosts you know, some of the most public access waters of all of northwestern New Jersey. Uh, so in addition to the four, 24 river access points that, that are available along the Flatbrook, uh, there are just countless miles that run through either National Park Service, uh, state park, uh, state forest, or wildlife management area lands. Um, and so they're just really great opportunities for both stocked trout fishing in the main stem of the Flatbrook, uh, as well as the most opportunities for wild trout uh, fishing uh, on public lands um, in the northwest part of the state. 81 different miles of trout producing uh, wild trout waters. Not all of them you know, might provide a great fishing experience, but they're at least fun to explore if you're into that sort of uh, experience. Uh, the pollen skill, um, just over the the Kittatinia Ridge from the Flatbrook um, actually boasts the most, the highest number of uh, state managed fisheries um, of all of our great waters in Northwestern New Jersey. Um, and that, those 77 miles are actually split across seven different streams. So the pollen scale provides some pretty good diversity in the, in the types of uh, stream fishing that you get to do in this watershed, you know, from smaller uh, kind of mountainous streams coming off the Kittatinia Ridge to kind of uh, kind of lazy sections of the pollen scale, uh, pretty flat waters to fish uh, for stocked rainbow trout. Uh, the Pequest is uh, has one of the best uh, trout conservation areas um, in New Jersey. Um, however, it's, it's a pretty small area and does get fished pretty heavily. Uh, but if you're patient and you're willing to explore, you know the 66 other miles that the Pequest offers in terms of. Uh, stocked fishing opportunities. Um, it's, it's a great watershed to explore. And again, it provides a lot of good variety from smaller stream fishing uh, up to the larger uh, river itself. The Lopat um, is, a, is a stream that's pretty special to me. Uh, Trout and Lemon is doing quite a bit of work here. Uh, and it's, it's unique, I think, because it provides a really great both stocked and wild trout fishery that's climate resilient um, through a pretty developed area of Phillipsburg, um, Lepakong, and Pohakong townships. Um, so because of groundwater, it just provides this great uh, habitat for these, for these stocked and wild fish in a place that's really accessible to a lot of people and a lot of people can get out fishing uh, in the stream. So it's a great small little system. The Pohat, um, on paper, it doesn't look like it has a ton of access, and, and that's true. Uh, but the river access points it does have, you know, are actually um, they provide a decent amount of, of river frontage, so you can wade pretty far at many of these different access points. Um, although it would be great at some point to increase access opportunities within the Pohacon watershed. Um, this is a cool system because it again is is pretty well fed by groundwaters through much of its uh, main stem section, so you can get both. Um, wild brown trout in, in the main stem, as well as stocked fishing opportunities, uh, in addition to two uh, state designated wild trout streams uh, that flow into the Pohatcong itself. And then finally, uh, the Musconetcom River watershed, uh, you know, is probably the crown jewel in terms of public access for this area. You know, it provides 45 different river access points along its length. Uh, many of the many of the miles of the Musconetcom are floatable, so you know if you like fishing as well as you know kayaking or other types of boating, you know, this would be a great stream for you. Uh, and I think it's really notable because it is one of just four national wildland scenic rivers um, in New Jersey. 
um, and you know has a, a national uh, water trail associated with it. So it's just a really cool stream to explore, um, and many of its tributaries areas also uh, support wild trout populations on public access lands. So I'm going to transition now over to Marsha. I hope you learned from the first two parts of this talk, uh, you know, why we care about fishing and where we can fish in northwestern New Jersey. Uh, and now Marsha's going to talk a little bit more about how we can actually grow our angler uh, steward community. Thank you, Keith. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Um, when we talk about growing our angler steward community uh, to sustain watershed conservation, it's absolutely important that we talk about engaging and learning from the stakeholders in our communities to identify and remedy river degradation. And that means collaboration to the benefit of all. Keith, the next slide, please. Uh, this slide talks about some of the um, numbers and the things that have gone on with trout fishing. Um, specifically, the first one talks about in the last seven years, 13% of the U.S. population participated in freshwater fishing, only 13%. And that speaks to um, a disconnect for a great portion of the uh, population. As we look down, we do see um, that the participation rate in the Hispanic American community has increased significantly. And what I have recently seen as in most, in many cases, conservation has been uh, followed and most heavily voted upon in that very same community. 91% of the current anglers began fishing during childhood, but after 12, it seems it's most likely that um, they are less likely to try fishing for their lifetime. So what this says is um, in many of our communities, parents are otherwise engaged and busy working, maintaining a household, and there can be little time for community outreach um, and or engagement. And that might account for not trying new things. So I wonder where are our mentors at this point? Schools are stressing football and basketball and not getting out into the outdoors. The next slide, please. Uh, we're talking about uh, here some of the barriers to angling, and yes, there are some. Um, there's a lack of awareness. There's the lack of involvement, inexperience with diverse communities. Uh, there's a lack of access sometimes. And the assumptions and myths about folks that we don't really know. Uh, one of the things that uh, Kristen said in the beginning um, and, and Keith talked about a bit, uh, TU is a huge, phenomenal organization, um, many chapters and approximately 36 councils throughout this United States. I am one of four women to lead a council in this country and the only woman of color to do so. And I tell you that not as a brag, although I am proud of my involvement with TU. I think we do phenomenal work, have done phenomenal work. But I tell you that because I hope that one day that won't be something that I can say, that it won't be a thing. So that I am stressing because of who I am personally, this kind of involvement in communities and because as a person working with a large organization, it is the right thing um, for us to do as well. Keith, the next slide, please. When we talk about some of the ways to remove these barriers, um, education, and that's a two-way street. That's educating the community 
and those folks who may serve the communities from a various organizations um, that they need to be educated as well. We need to be involved in the communities. We need to remove some stereotypical notions about what communities want and what they do. Uh, we want to listen, to learn, and assist by doing. We want to get into the communities and, and help in these ways, but we can't go in with the notion that we know it all. We can learn a great deal from the members in the community as to what they want, what they're interested in, is, and what they need. Um, and we need to have discussions on conservation um, to help to people to see uh, things as simple as the right to clean water. Uh, we wanted them to understand the positive effects of being in the outdoors. Last year, I had the uh, privilege to do um, a talk similar to this with the biology students at Temple. And one of the things we said is it, it doesn't always have to be fishing. Now we are a conservation organization made up of people who love to fish, but who are also um, interested in conservation uh, and, and caring about the environment and protecting it and leaving it better for future generations. But um, being in the outdoors can also be especially in these times, a great way to reduce stress. Just take a walk by the stream, see what you can see and learn from each other. Um, Keith, would you go on to the next one, please? There are some organizations who have come about um, that speak to the needs um, of many diverse populations. And you have a list here. Uh, if you would like to, please go to them and, and see what they are doing to address the needs and the desires of folks within our communities. We want to make sure that we are serving the communities where we are doing work. Keith, could you go to the next slide, please? At TU, there are several ways in which we're looking to engage uh, young folks now and for the future. We have uh, Trout in the Classroom, we call that TIC, and that's a partnership with uh, schools and young people and teaching them about raising trout and caring for them. It's a phenomenal program, and I'm pleased to say that it is back engaged now this year and the children were thrilled to receive their eggs. They keep a, a, uh, a place to keep the fish um, and they have teachers who are engaged with them and they're learning responsibility for things in their community. Stream Girls is a program uh, with young women um, that engages them in science, technology, recreation, um, and the arts. And so it brings together lots of things to help them become personally connected to local waters. Five Rivers is our program um, for college age uh, young people to learn about conservation and angling. But we are diverse in that we want to reach out to lots of folks, be that gender, age, capability, and yes, sometimes race. Um, and so these programs are doing a lot to engage our young people and we're really pretty proud of that. Uh, next, Keith. One of the uh, other programs that to you is um, leading on is our service partnership. Um, this is an update of a program we had previously, um, but now includes not only military personnel, um, but uh, fire, medical, EMTs, frontline workers to engage them 
in what we feel is the healing power of the water and just to simply say thank you and get them out to enjoy the waters that we're protecting. And hopefully they will uh, want to become engaged with us in this mission. They receive a free TU membership for a year and our Trout Magazine and there are um, outings such as you see on the screen um, to give them a respite from the challenges of dealing with what this service may have brought on them. So we are really thrilled about that and we're, we're looking forward uh, to continuing that throughout the year. Uh, the next slide, please. One of the things that we're most proud of um, is our work in diversity and inclusion, our permanent uh, work group for that. Um, it is my feeling and I think feeling of most of uh, our members that we have been responsible for moving TU's efforts with regard to diversity and inclusion from practice to plan and from, from plan to practice, I should say and improving communications and how we work around these issues in the conservation and environmental science work throughout our country and throughout our organization. Uh, I think that um, our chair of the diversity and inclusion work group, Ms. Kelly Bookta is also on the line. Yes, I'm here. Kelly, if you would like to give our these folks some more, uh, just a brief in-depth of uh, what the work group has done and accomplished, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, the National uh, Diversity and Inclusion Work Group is led by National Leadership Council representatives that are elected by states that in within Trout Unlimited that have councils, as well as a group of very hardy and robust volunteers with the mission to move what was known as an initiative to got women involved in the organization, but to a practice and move it to a larger realm of diverse, uh, diverse and inclusive beings, whether this is able-bodied, disabled-bodied, gender, race, ethnicity, the whole nine uh, yards of that could encompass the word diversity and inclusion. Uh, the work group meets monthly, um, and it's a, on a monthly evening call, and we sit around uh, and with Zoom and conference calls and talk, spend a lot of time talking, but that talking leads to the practice of how we could break down barriers, how we could network with other organizations, how we could leverage our passion for conservation and for angling and our ethics of proper angling and handling of fish and hiking and how all these things work together. Um, there's not, you know, fishing and hiking and mountain biking, you know, they might be little niche groups, but at the end of the day, they all fall under the umbrella of outdoor activities. Um, and we know that nature has restorative powers. Uh, we've seen it with the pandemic and people in the overload of screen time, you know, wanting to be outdoors and have their feet on terra firma and, and air and trees and the water and, and, the, and, and everything in that beautiful, you know, natural world. So as a work group, um, we don't have, uh, we, we don't have a lot of, we have a lot of say in not so much the running of the national organization, but in where we wanted to see. We're aware that uh, fishing, as Marcia had in the slide, was 81% white. And we want to see those demographics change so that they mirror the face of America, that they mirror the current face of society, and that it's not a sport known for the elite or the barriers and the habitats of people who were once excluded from national park because of segregation and Jim Crow laws, people who were once segregated or uh, not allowed in because they had issues of walking, wheelchair, accessible trails that are made easy for that, uh, for all people to enjoy the outdoors. So the work group uh, works uh, in, in in partnership with National Trout Unlimited, but also within the states um, and the volunteers and other out, outlets and programs and, and, corporate and companies and organizations to try to promote a practice of being diverse and inclusive, of being inviting to all people who are interested, whether it's catching a fish, <clears throat> planting a tree, doing a, a litter pluck, a cleanup, um, to get communities involved in meeting them in the communities and making community where people are. 
Um, sometimes the barrier is getting to a riverfront area or to a watershed. But I'm certain that every area has a body of water that might have some Dunkin' Donuts cups or might have some uh, quick check wrappers that are wa that are littering around, and there's a very easy low hanging fruit of a of a clean of a cleanup of an area of a park of a green space to get people involved in, in the conservation, and then the water in the, the clean water that they all follow suit like a domino effect. Mm. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Keith. We talked about being in communities and listening to the people in communities and involving them in the work that we're doing and and finding out from them what they need, what they'd like to see happen. And there are lots of partnerships going on. Uh, this is uh, one that was led by Peace New Jersey and the Musconetcom Watershed. Um, and very successful. We are doing lots of collaborations to make sure we are meeting people where they are, helping them to get access, listening to what they're interested in. Um, Keith, one of the things I wanted to mention, there's another program that's going on, and I think five or six cities throughout the United States have signed on. New York, I think Philadelphia is looking to do it, and I'm not sure um, I can't remember what the other ones, other cities were, but it's called the 10 minute walk. And that's to have that kind of green access for people within 10 minutes of their home. So they're looking to do more of these kinds of parks throughout the United States. Um, as you saw, there's a list of folks who are doing um, things in, in not only in their communities, but spread out throughout the country um, for conservation, for awareness building, for diversity, for inclusion. And those are some great resources for uh, people to look to when they have questions, as is our very own Trout Unlimited. Keith, is there anything else? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks Marcia for taking on that section and discussing, uh, discussing how we're trying to grow our community um, and why we should, why we need to. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. I just want to recap quickly what we discussed today. You know, hopefully you learned a little bit about how you know angling attracts uh, stewardship and conservation funding uh, to um, to our local watersheds, um, and that's one of the reasons why we one of the potential reasons why we can engage anglers. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit more about some of the fishing uh, we have available to us in northwestern New Jersey and how to find those places, and finally how we're thinking of growing. Um, our angling community and our conservation community uh, so that it's more inclusive and uh, really to, to sustain our efforts moving forward as an organization and to um, just to do the right thing. So um, with that, we can take any questions. Um, thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody, for that great talk. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Ryan wanted to know, who would be the most likely entity to do the finer scale work on the economic benefits of fishing in Northwest New Jersey? Do you feel that it's um, academia or state government or some other entity? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Is that Ryan Jorley? Yes. Okay. Uh, it might be a question more for, for Alan Hunt of the Muscanet Kong Watershed Association, uh, but I've seen some of those studies done uh, both by um, sort of independent consultants um, uh, as well as, you know, through academics. So I think they're, you know, I'm not sure really the pros and cons of pursuing either one. Um, I do think it would be useful to, to have some of that information for Northwestern New Jersey. Um, it is something we think about a lot, but we don't actually know the extent to which uh, angling in the, in the Northwest actually benefits our, our regional economy. Okay. And then um, the second question was, does Trout Unlimited have any sense of the diversity of anglers by percentage? Um, so uh, actually first, I guess, Marsha or Kelly, do you have more updated 
numbers from in, the LC? In um, yes, in terms of uh, on the when someone becomes a Trout Limited member, um, we do not ask. Uh, we do ask a question of their gender, or they could leave that gender preference neutral, but we do not ask their race in terms of membership. So uh, right now we do consider the organization to be, I think it's roughly about 90% male and about 91% white. Um, it's a very high percentage, and, and I think that's something that we've you know we've been focused on in looking to change with the with the demographics as the as the world itself is is changing. Um, but those are the most current demographics there. Um, the Recreation, Boating, and Fishing Foundation (RBFF) that's a special report on fishing that is annotated in the in the presentation. They have some demographics that encompass uh, sales of licensing from TakeMeFishing.org. That when you purchase a license in any state across the U.S., you get this email, this survey, and they ask for respondents. So they have a pretty good core group sampling from the Midwest, the Northeast, across the the, the whole continent, um, in, in areas and states. And they break down based on freshwater fishing, saltwater fishing, lake fishing. And those demographics do change, where there are about 45 to 50 percent men and women. In some cases, children as well. So that would be one of the special report on fishing, and that's updated every year based on licensing sales. I just put a link to that study that Kelly's discussing um, in the chat. The one thing I will say is that there are eight chapters in Trout Unlimited in New Jersey, and they all have websites and social media, and we encourage you to visit those and visit the state council website, and Keith can get that information in the chat, or Marsha could, uh, to, to partner with a chapter in, if, if you're an organization or someone singularly watching the call, uh, watching partaking in the conference to do that, because there's very easy ways from schools to community centers and public libraries. Um, I'm always an advocate for public libraries in terms of they already have a community, they have a membership, they, they understand the community that they live in and work in and who their members and participants are that attend to programs that are an easy way to, to start out. I know you're laughing. Uh, I do love the public libraries, um, but I often think that they're overlooked in terms of the fabric of communities. Mm -hmm. Almost all communities have one. They are funded by state and local taxes, so there, there's never too much of an issue, uh, you know, them of having programs in place because they're serving the community um, in any of the eight chapters I think Marsha will agree with me will gladly uh, partner with a public library or and, and start building up a program in an area Keith if uh, anyone would like further information on what we're doing in the state and what our chapters are involved in um, and what we're looking forward to doing um, they can contact me directly and you can put my email in this. Okay, I'll put your email in the chat. Yes, um, we, are, uh, we are also working. There's something that many people may not know about in New Jersey. New Jersey has one of the most phenomenal um, citizen science opportunities as the New Jersey School of Conservation which has recently reopened. It was originally managed by Montclair. It is now being managed by the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And we are uh, working to help uh, get programs restarted. It, it educated young people, uh, college age students, teachers are getting educated there. It is in Sandiston and um, it is a phenomenal opportunity, one of its kind in the country, so that you can look to uh, the New Jersey School of Conservation for more programming, um, inclusive programming of uh, young people. Uh, we're going to get a school of uh, fly fishing restarted there. Uh, as I say, again, there's teacher education going there and things for young people so that communities can come together in a place that's really beautiful. And it's right next door. Um, it's got its own lake and places to stay. And they're trying to get getting that re restarted. Um, and part of the Flatbrook runs right near the property. So that's, a, that's another opportunity within New Jersey. Excellent. So uh, Michael has a question about when engaging in either diversity projects or conservation projects, what age bracket should you really focus on? Would you suggest under 12 
or um, like the 12 to 21 year old age group or young adults or older adults or even retired populations? What would you suggest would be the target? We're always going to want to engage young people because this is why we're, this is a great deal of the portion of why we're doing this work. We want to leave them something that's better than the way we found it. Um, and we have the opportunities from uh, elementary school children to high school age kids and then on to college kids. So that's depending on what you feel most comfortable about. That's a three uh, groups, diverse groups based on age. We also have, as I said, the service partnership group which is a way you may want to give back and connect in the outdoors um, with folks who were veterans, who were medical uh, people, uh, who were fire, who were police, um, and maybe yourselves. That That's a way that we're reaching out and connecting with people. And that's of all ages. It can be, it doesn't have to be a specific uh, wartime, um, and we're finding that a lot of people, as we know from the last year and a half, have needed to connect and have needed to be engaged in the environment and the outdoors as a, as a stress relief. Um, and then the chapters have folks who have been involved in conservation for a long time, some older folks who have great history and great experience. And if you want to learn uh, whether it's conservation, restoration, protection, fly fishing, fly tying. Um, our chapters uh, throughout the state are a great place to, to join us and to learn. And we're still somewhat online, um, but there are people we're starting back with some in-person things. So there, there's, there's something for everyone within our New Jersey um, Trout Unlimited family. And would you be able to talk about what projects Crowd Unlimited is currently working on within um, Northwestern New Jersey? And do you have any information on what towns or parks they're located within? Oh, Keith, there you go. Uh, so I'd say that uh, really right now in Northwestern New Jersey, we just have, uh, I'd say two major projects um, happening on the ground. One is a, a restoration project um, along the Lepacon Creek um, that covers portions of uh, both Phillipsburg, Lepacon, and Pahacon townships, um, each of which uh, you know, have parks adjacent to either within or adjacent to where we're doing restoration work. Um, so I think that's a place where we can and should be um, kind of engaging the community more. And so we've we started to do that and are thinking about ways um, that we should we should engage with, I think, those communities. It's also just a, a great fishery in general, um, great public access. So it's a great place to do that work. So I hope we can grow uh, some engagement around Lepak Hong um, uh, in the coming months and years. Um, and then um, we're working actually with uh, Peace NJ is, and the MWA are leading this effort um, in Hackettstown, uh, but really to just in, get better engage the community um, in Hackettstown uh, with respect to fishing, uh, with watershed conservation, with really uh, whatever um, the, it winds up that the community is really looking uh, to engage in. So that's kind of been my biggest learning lesson uh, is to really just kind of sit back and, and hear from our partners and hear from community members um, uh, what, what they, what they might need and and if you know if and when to you might be able to provide it. So, uh, working with Peace NJ and, and MWA have been great so far, uh, and thinking about you know how can we contribute to you know teaching some kids to fish or developing certain resources, uh, you know that the community might need. So the whole middle part of this talk was you know about uh, you know TU and and some others basically developing more resources to to increase access, uh, information about access to the outdoors in Northwest New Jersey. Um, but, you know, some of that information might still be very inaccessible to certain communities for, for a bunch of different reasons. So just continually thinking about, um, you know, 
you know, is our work in Northwestern New Jersey really you know, benefiting as many as people as we as we'd like to? So those are the two places that I see us working most right now. Um, otherwise, we're going through some conservation planning uh, processes at the state level uh, through a priority waters project where we're looking outside the basin, uh, but still within Northwest New Jersey uh, to find out, you know, to, to start thinking about as a state council, as a staff, as chapters, you know, where we'd like to be doing wild trout conservation work in the future. Uh, and a significant part of that discussion, you know, should uh, be thinking about, you know, what are the communities or who are the communities that might benefit from our work or who could you know, help us um, in our mission and who could be help out as well. So having those conversations at the state level is going to be important as well. And for the final question, this ties into what you were just saying. If anyone has an area that they think would be in need of restoration, who should they reach out to it to you? Should it be you, Keith? Uh, yeah, I think um, you can always start with me. Um, if it's not really a region that uh, I work in, um, we can send you to the, the chapter that, that's maybe best suited to that, or you know, some folks on the council, um, you know, and just start discussing discussing that potential project. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for attending this workshop, and let's thank our speakers for a great session. Uh, these slides will be shared on the Northwest New Jersey Rivers dot org website, which is our conference website, um, after our our two days session. So at this point, our next uh, workshop is not going to be starting until 345. But I ask you to join the expo session by clicking on the left hand side of your screen. And there's a lot of good content from some of our speakers today and also from the different organizations that help plan this event for us. So thank you, everybody. You can be over you. to the expo. Thank you very much. Thank you.